On December 17th, at 2 o'clock in the morning, Arthur McDuffie was fatally beaten here on this spot after a high-speed police chase. 1980, it was an, an incredible year. African Americans were still trying to find uh, their way in the system. There was still a lot of pushback. Um, schools had just been integrated. Um, some of our black leaders were just coming on board. But it was a struggle. It was still a struggle. There was this man, an insurance salesman by the name of Arthur McDuffie, who was riding uh, his motorcycle, uh, stopped by police. There was a high-speed chase when McDuffie, on a borrowed motorcycle, popped a wheelie on a Brownsville corner. Four Metro officers pursued McDuffie and were joined by City of Miami police. This is where the chase ended, and here is where the questions begin. McDuffie crashed his motorcycle, but some of the wounds he sustained are not consistent with the accident. McDuffie did not hit his head and wreck the bike. Witnesses say he got off the bike and was talking to the four Metro officers. Basically, according to some of the evidence, he was beaten to death. Some substantial use of force was used at the scene after the chase, and the subject died of critical injuries resulting from that use of force. Things got a little tense after that. The medical examiner said somebody stood over him, straddled his body while he was on the ground, and hit him in the forehead with a kel light. The Dade County medical examiner says 33-year-old Arthur McDuffie never had an accident on this corner. The autopsy clearly shows he was murdered, beaten with blunt instruments like police flashlights until his skull was crushed. He remained in a coma at Jackson Memorial Hospital until he died five days after the beating. Dr. Wright, what made you decide that the, the death of Arthur McDuffie was not the result of a traffic accident? The correlation of his injuries with the scene examination and the examination of the bicycle clearly indicated that he was beaten to death. He had no injuries from uh, an accident falling off his motorcycle or, or wrecking the motorcycle? No significant injuries whatsoever. What did he die from? He died as a result of blunt head injuries with destruction of his underlying brain. He was beaten to death. They beat my child to death. They beat him to death like a dog. Just like a dog. They beat him to death. They beat up his head like a dog. <laughs> Among themselves, the four policemen, Sergeant Ira Diggs and officers Michael Watts, Alex Marrero, and Charles Viverka, have 47 complaints on their records, 12 involving physical force. None were ever convicted of brutality. Now they face possible murder charges. So it went to trial. It was tra the trial was transferred to Tampa. Frank Lynn has been covering the trial in Tampa. He has this live eye report for us. Frank? Jim, it took three weeks to find a jury here. It took four weeks to hear all the arguments and the evidence, but it took the jury less than three hours to reach the verdict. The six members of the all-white male jury left the courtroom at 11.30. Two hours and 40 minutes later, they signaled a verdict was at hand. A deadly still courtroom awaited them. We, the jury at Tampa, Hillsborough County, this 17th day of May, 1980, by the defendant, Michael Watts, as to manslaughter, as charged in count two of the information, not guilty. So say we all, David H. Fisher, former. On it went, former Sergeant Ira Diggs, not guilty of two counts of manslaughter, not guilty of aggravated battery, tampering with evidence and accessory after the fact. Alex Marrero, cleared of second degree murder, acquitted of manslaughter and not guilty of tampering with evidence. Finally, not guilty verdicts for former Metro Sergeant Herb Evans on charges of tampering with evidence and accessory after the fact. I thought it was a joke when it started. And I don't think it should have ever gotten this far in the first place. Why did you think it was a joke? I don't think we were treated fairly by a number of people name that it. had vested interest. I'm not going to name names, but I'll say the Public Safety Department. I'll say the State Attorney's Office. I'll say the community itself. The truth came out. We're going to have to live with the truth. The people can't live with the truth, and what are we going to live with? Once more, Alex, what is your reaction to the truth? Honey, 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 my reaction is the truth came out, and thank God. This country still has people who are honest and can base their opinion on the truth. This would not have happened if the investigation had gone forward internally, and if necessarily, over to the state's attorney's office immediately, the, t the day or the day after it happened. But it was since it was delayed for eight days and nothing, and not until the press got a hold of it, that this was blown up out of proportion. That's why we're here, and that's why we were charged. That's why other officers have quit, resigned, have quit, and, and have been basically, if not prosecuted, persecuted. Oh, I'm going to take me home.
Bob Gilder is a Tampa businessman, a black businessman, who's been watching this trial almost every day for the U.S. Civil Rights Commission. He was angry this afternoon. He says he tried in vain to keep this trial from coming to Tampa in the first place. He called the outcome typical Tampa justice. Frank Lynn, Channel 4 News, Tampa. I have lost uh, what little faith I've been able to maintain in this system uh, as of today. I think a great many other people will feel the same way. I think this is one of the worst things that has happened in Miami, and I was bitterly disappointed that people were not held accountable for the act. I remember the day that the verdict came in, and I could hear the tone of voice of the people on the radios talking about this not guilty verdict that came in against these police officers. Today, several decisions were handed down in Tampa that shocked many of us, tore a lot of us apart inside, and made us extremely emotional. Somehow, in this town, black people must be able to deal with this in an orderly fashion. Oh, no. Oh, no. I really don't believe justice was done, but I feel like in the end it will be done. And Miami just erupted. It started before sundown at the Metro Justice Building with a peaceful rally involving both blacks and whites. But as C.T. Taylor tells us in this Live Eye report, it quickly turned to violence. When the violence started, our reporters and photographers were right there on that spot when it started started at the state attorney's office. I remember C.T. Taylor was right in the middle of it, calling the shots and saying, it's about to go down. Get everybody out here. Community leaders urged the black community to show up here at the Metro Justice Building to show their feelings of the, on the outcome of the so-called McDuffie verdict. And several hundred people did show up. At the start of the demonstration, things were peaceful. But as the crowd grew, tempers began to flare. The Metro Justice Building became the center of frustration. Bricks and bottles were thrown in the window of the Metro Justice Building, and several cars were overturned and burned. The violence quickly spread to surrounding streets. After about two hours of uncontrolled activities, police finally moved in in the area. Would you recommend that people come to this area for any reason whatsoever? I would say no. I would say to stay out of the area and uh, wait till uh, calm subsides totally. Uh, tempers are still flaring and, uh, you know, there could be problems. Just stay out of the area for the time being. The Metro police uh, cleanup crews are in the area right now. And as I said, order is uh, restored in this particular area. However, there are many reports that uh, uncontrolled activity is going on in other parts of uh, Miami. Almost simultaneously, violence then broke out in other areas. This is Coconut Grove black area of the main highway looking like a combat zone. Store windows broken and merchandise looted, cars overturned. All up and down the street, burglar alarms broke the silence of the early morning calm that had finally returned. But it was the black areas of Brownsville and Liberty City in Northwest Day that suffered the most. Fires were set all along several blocks of 27th Avenue. Businesses were looted. Fire officials report responding to 10 major calls. As the violence continued, the number of casualties grew. As we said, 10 persons are known to have been killed, more than 60 injured, some directly involved in the riots, others innocent bystanders, blacks, whites, and Hispanics, who just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Some were dragged from their smashed cars and beaten. We've seen all sorts of major trauma, from gunshot wounds, stab wounds, people beaten up every part of the body, from the head, abdomen, chest, you name it, it's a happen. As far as an emergency medical situation here in Dade County, here in Miami, how bad of a situation does it seem to be? It's a disaster. It's a war zone. There's a war going out there. And uh, it's, it's one of the worst I've ever seen here. In all, Jackson treated 12 gunshot wounds, 14 stabbings, and more than 30 other patients with miscellaneous injuries. 10 are said to be in critical condition. The jails, too, were crowded to capacity. By 5.30 this morning, nearly 100 persons had been arrested on a variety of charges, including burglary, looting, and obstruction of justice. Everything that can be done has been done. We've been in uh, 
direct communication with the governor. At the National Guard Armory on 7th Avenue and 28th Street, a force of 700 men was being called out. Only 200 will be sent out at a time, the others when needed. Being in a major riot, and I did cover a lot of riots, you know, your life is in danger, you're out there. Um, you know, you're worried about, you know, how the police are going to react to you. You know, people are legitimately, in their minds, angry, and you need to tread lightly. It can be an incredibly dangerous and an incredibly confusing time, you know, listening to both sides and trying your best to be objective as a reporter. Injustice! And so began a night of violence in Dade County, the black community's response to the acquittals in the Arthur McDuffie case. Ignited by the jury's decision to acquit four former Dade Public Safety Department officers of his death. And this afternoon, the fuse is still lit. The toll so far, nine persons killed, 120 injured, and as many as 100 persons arrested. Damage alone will no doubt run into the millions. On 36th Street and 22nd Avenue, vans and cars were strewn on the side of the road. Some were burned out. Many storefronts were demolished. Some furniture was littering the sidewalks. Broken glass was everywhere. National Guardsmen drove silently through the streets surveying the damage. Their rifles were pointed up in the air to let anyone know that they were armed and ready for trouble. But it never came. All they found was evidence of the rioting and looting that was so rampant just hours before. The guardsmen were the first to see close up the extent of the destruction. It looked like a war zone. Off 27th Avenue and 62nd Street, huge billows of black smoke filled the sky. The fires burned out of control. Metro fire units were unable to respond to their calls in some neighborhoods because the police couldn't guarantee their safety. On almost every block of 27th Avenue between 36th Street and 79th Street, the scars of the McDuffie riot were burning deep into the community. 1980 has been a difficult year for Eula Bell McDuffie. In Tampa, she testified in the trial of five Metro police officers charged with the beating death of her son. And she had to live with a verdict which touched off three days of racial rioting in Liberty City. In the midst of the rioting, Mrs. McDuffie went on Channel 4 and pleaded for an end to the violence. It was a horrible time, and it changed the face of Miami, probably one of the most interesting parts of it. You had McDuffie riot, and then you had Marielle. And at the same time, you had 100,000 Haitians come in. It was just an incredible time, 1980.